This is about a, a, a nebulous fear of government overreach and, and distrust of the CDC and so on. And I'm not saying that some of those concerns aren't uh, well-founded or not legitimate concerns, but here's what we have to weigh, say as an institution that's trying to decide whether to impose a mandate or what type of exemptions to allow. Is this person in expressing their conscientious <laughs> ob uh, objection to receiving this particular vaccine and the reason that they're giving for it, is it consistent with other things that they'll do? Um, and, and so I'll just give one quick example. Um, a lot of people who have a religious-based obje objection to these vaccines is because of the remote material causal connection to at least one abortion, potentially two that were done uh, 40, 50 years ago um, that created these immortalized uh, cell lines that were then used in the, in the development and testing these vaccines. And what we've now come to know, I mean, what it's been known, but maybe the general public didn't really realize is how ubiquitous these cell lines are in research for all sorts of pharmaceuticals, including over-the-counter pharmaceuticals and processed food additives and so on. So now that they know this, they may not have known it before, but now that they know this, are they also going to stop taking Advil when they get a headache? Are they going to stop you know, eating frozen meals? Um, because it's likely also these cell lines were involved in it. So we can test for certain things, right? We test for consistency. And is the person really informed about making this conscientious choice? And Jason, that's excellent. I was going to say you, you open the door um, with the reference to the Catholic intellectual tradition of us getting into a really geeky Thomas fight. Um, but I'm going to avoid that for everyone else. Um, and I, I really appreciate, especially for all of my students who are on this, um, on this call, uh, the point about consistency. So that's really helpful. We may come back um, to the Catholic intellectual tradition, but I'm going to move forward, bug our other panelists, and then we'll loop you back into the Q&A. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, we're now gonna to turn to our second panelist and take a slightly more focused um, view. Uh, Paul Cummins is a research assistant professor at bioethics, uh, at, in bioethics at Clarkson University and also works um, at Mount Sinai in New York, uh, a place I'm quite fond of as my daughter was born there. Paul, it's great to see you. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, it's great um, to be here. Thank you for having me, Brian. Um, uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to being part of this conversation with you and Jason and Kirk. Well, we're very glad you're here. Um, so uh, for folks who don't know, um, Paul's written a phenomenal piece, um, which just well came out recently um, in Healthcare Ethics Committee Forum in an issue devoted to questions of conscience. And I'm going to go right there. So lots of times, and I'll give a little background, Paul, and then you can uh, correct it. But for folks who are a little less familiar with sort of the ethical theories and the debates um, around conscience. Uh, questions of conscience in healthcare and more broadly are often discussed as, um, uh, well, it's a two-party issue, right? So in thinking about healthcare, it's often patient and practitioner. It had been patient and physician historically. Um, and so it's, it's viewed as, um, well, yeah, as, as two folks sort of engage in this. Uh, some of Paul's work, especially in this paper, highlights um, what more folks have been talking about, which is that as physicians and other healthcare workers are increasingly employed by hospital, by hospitals and healthcare systems, we really need to think about this as a tripartite relationship, right? Um, which brings the employer in. So um, you should all go uh, read and download Paul's piece. But um, Paul, help us think through the sort of complicated um, landscape of um, folks who might be asking for vaccine exemptions of particularly employed folks, workers in hospitals or other settings who might yeah. be asking for exemptions in light of this tripartite relationship. Right, so I think there are, so what I'll say is I think characterizing it as, three, as a three place relationship makes sense in a way that there are multiple parties with stakes in, in the outcome of, um, an instance where um, a healthcare provider claims a conscientious objection. Um, I think what it still remains a two place relationship in the sense that there's the person who asks to exercise conscientious objection, and then there's the party that has to respond to that uh, request. Um, and so I got to thinking about it in, in, in these terms a little bit because you know, I saw in, in different places that there were more and more um, 
uh, formal complaints to, you know, the government that people were claiming that their personal conscientious or religious beliefs were being violated by their employers, right? And what struck me is that when we think of the relationship um, between a provider and a patient, the patient, they have very little recourse, right? They, they ask the provider for something, the provider says, no, I conscientiously object, and, what, and the patient can't do anything about it, right? Like, okay, I'm, uh, I can't do anything. But when there's a employer in the picture who is expecting the employee healthcare provider to carry out job responsibilities, now suddenly there is a party in place who can do something about the refusal, right? And so it struck me as that questions like, do people have a right to conscientious objection, right? And is it absolute in the way that Jason sort of introduced as, as, as one way of thinking it in the past, and maybe it's become more complicated because of the facts of um, the pandemic, aren't really the central question, right? So I take a conscientious objection, like an instance of a conscientious objection to be a request by an individual to be made exempt or, um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, relieved of an expectation or freed from punishment for, for failing to meet an expectation. Um, and what, and, and since I think, and, and, and I say expectation because I don't want to use any more thick or morally loaded uh, terms than that, um, is that, we, we typically think it's ethical for people to ask for relief from expectations, right? Sometimes I ask people to let me out of the promise I make. Sometimes I ask people for leniency, um, et cetera. So that I think that the, the major question of conscientious objection is really how should others, right? How should the party with the expectation respond to the request, right? To be relieved of the expectation. Um, and so I think since... Typically, employers, right, um, can are, are the ones that are in place to enforce expectations. That raises a really um, uh, that that raises the stakes. That's where really where the rubber really hits the road, right? The employer has to say, "You've asked to be relieved of this expectation to become vaccinated, right? Should I, as your employer, grant you, you know, an exemption?" Um, and so I think. And then if you, if I don't grant the exemption and you still refuse to go ahead, right, what should I do? Should I, you know, say, okay, I forgive you, or, you know, I'm not going to punish you, or should I enforce some punishment? I think that like becomes like the, the, the central question. And so it's a really a question when somebody says, I'm not going to, um, I don't want to comply with your expectation. Should we let you out of it? Right. And, and I think though that, um, what matters in a conscientious objection is that the objector admits the legitimacy, right, of the, of the expectation, right? That they say, I understand it, it's legitimate. There are perfectly good reasons to, to, to expect this of me and to expect this of other people, but I'm looking to be, you know, exempted. And I think typically, I think we should, right, when people invoke conscience, right, people um, of, you know, uh, um, and, and, I, and I'm going to take for granted that these folks are sincere, right? I think unless we can't achieve the goal, right, that the expectation advances without that person's compliance with the expectation, we should, you know, let people follow their conscience. But if the goal is sufficiently important and we can't achieve that goal without their compliance, then we shouldn't exempt them. Now, I think, you know, we're, we're not going to drag people, you know, to the uh, vaccination clinic and, and, and stick a needle in their arm. Um, so I think for, for healthcare employees, right, who say, I'm, I refuse to be vaccinated, I think the question is, you know, is, now that the um, employer uh, can't, you know, compel them to, to get vaccinated, right, are they going to dock them vacation days, right? Are they going to, you know, fire them? Um, and uh, I think 
some of those things, you know, it may be, yeah, let's dock you vacation days because the people who are going to have to come in and, and, you know, work extra time because we can't allow you in, you know, in clinical situations, maybe they get, we give them extra recovery time after their shifts and it's made up by your, you know, lost vacation days. So, so I think um, what, you know, becomes clear is that when there's an entity that has the power to enforce conscientious, uh, enforce an expectation or punish you for failing to fulfill the expectation, really the question is, right, are we justified in enforcing the expectation? And then for the folks who don't, are we justified in imposing some sort of penalty? And, and perhaps the, the, the prospect of penalty will get some people to comply. Um, but so I, I think the, the, the issue of employment is it like, has really raised that increasingly conscientious objectors may face um, uh, the prospect of, uh, I, I don't know, being held responsible, right, or, 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 or liable for those um, objections. And I think the, 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 the objector is also, you know, seeking if, you know, not exemption, then also some sort of leniency. Thank you. Paul, thank you. I mean, that uh, a tour de force for any of our healthcare admission administration students or any healthcare administrators he, right on, on, on the call um, in the kinds of things to think through when faced with what are really, really challenging decisions. And it's especially challenging, it seems, for at least two reasons, right? When you've sort of laid this out beautifully. Um, one challenge is that it's, right, the, vac- the COVID vaccines were, were new. So it's not as though even the best, um, administrators with the best policies could have thought in advance and tried to set up contractual obligations with employees in such a way um, that this was really, really clear. Um, but and we, I, I want to jump to Kirk in a moment, but I, the, the second point, I know that's a big one. The second point is it, it seems like healthcare uh, practitioners um, are under special focus. And maybe this is fair or not fair, but there's something about the vaccine being um, a healthcare item, for lack of a better term, right? So I have all sorts of weird um, views. I think the Mets are the best baseball team. No one's sort of coming to my door to really pay attention to my baseball views because I'm a philosopher. But there's something about, um, so people have uh, suggested, uh, sort of healthcare practitioners' role in healthcare and the vaccine as an item of health where um, folks are maybe expected to better understand the best evidence. I mean, there's a lot, a lot built in there. Any sort of quick comment before I jump to Kirk? Right. So, 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 then, I'll, I'll, so in response to the first question about the way that we couldn't have anticipated this, this requirement, right? Um, and, and you said like it wouldn't be in a contract, right? That's one of the reasons why I frame it in terms of expectations, right? Because a contract creates like a duty or obligation. Um, and, and I think... Um, a duty is like a, a form of expectation that we have of you, but it's like laid in with like moral theory. Um, but I think people come to have expectations of us in all sorts of different ways um, that are not, you know, necessarily just from promises. Um, if I like always shovel my elderly neighbors, you know, uh, sidewalk um, when it snows and, and I do it regularly all the time, she may come to have like an expectation um, that, that I'm going to do it. Um, and so, so, so one is that I'll say that like not being able to anticipate the vaccine doesn't mean that it's not a reasonable expectation to have that healthcare workers will um, take um, something that will make it safer for them to treat patients and for patients to be treated by them. Um, and in terms of the, the second thing, uh, I think, yeah, there, some people would go to the idea that healthcare workers um, should set an example, um, that they should demonstrate that they have the confidence in the safety and the, the, the sense of uh, social responsibility um, that we expect it, um, from the expertise and um, social commitment of those things. And those may be some of the reasons that we come to form the expectation. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, I think we've seen that it's not like always reliable to, to assume that they're going to 
um, uh, embody those kinds of presumptions. Um, and, 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 and sometimes, you know, we have to create demands, right? When, when people fall short of maybe the, the uh, ethical expectations we have for them. Thank you, Bo. Uh, a really nice answer to a, a, an unfairly large question. So um, <laughs> and we'll come back to this uh, in the Q&A. Um, we're now gonna turn to our third uh, expert, uh, Kirk Johnson. Kirk, uh, very glad you're here. Um, it is good to see you. It's good to be seen, as they say. <laughs> uh, do, uh, Reverend Dr. Kirk Johnson um, is, of course, most famously a Seton Hall alum, so go Pirates. He is currently the assistant professor in justice studies uh, at the great Montclair State University. So, Kirk, um, we're going to follow up with a couple of different questions, build on some themes Jason started um, in terms of religion, but also think about some institutions that Paul had on broadening past employment and maybe coming into communities and churches. So, um, first question. Um, is a big one. Uh, there are, and you're doing work on this, which is why I'm asking, but there's lots of folks who have been described as vaccine hesitant. They have concerns about um, taking the vaccine. And in light of this, um, sometimes conscience or conscientious objection are appealed to. However, you're doing work highlighting that in some communities, though they've been thought to be vaccine hesitant, um, there's actually a, a vaccine access issue. So I want to throw both of these ideas out there. Could you tell folks um, on the call who may be less familiar what's going on with vaccine hesitancy um, and also um, what's going on with your work on vaccine access? Yeah. Um, so first, uh, thank you for having me. It's always uh, good to uh, be back and uh, talk about such important issues. Uh, well, first, uh, vaccine hesitancy. Sorry, Kirk, I think uh, we might have accidentally lost the, uh, the volume on you. There we go. So sorry, start over. No, it's okay. So, so what I was saying, so basically um, vaccine hesitancy, uh, dominantly communities of color uh, have a lot to do, uh, or at least understood generally speaking as a, a mistrust issue that uh, communities of color do not trust uh, the medical uh, establishment, the medical institution, because of the history of race and medicine, which obviously is the case, but is not the uh, only particular reason why there's hesitancy. Second, um, I believe, of course, is through access, right? Um, not as much today. Um, you could go to any pharmacy um, and, and get vaccinated, right? So it's, it's less um, um, restrictive. But in the earlier months uh, of vaccination, Usually it's like an assembly line. You go to a main um, uh, center um, throughout New Jersey specifically or where, wherever um, there are available uh, vaccinations. And you are generally with a lot of people, um, dozens if not hundreds of individuals and you get vaccinated. And usually these particular places you have to drive right? You have to have a vehicle in order to drive. At least that was my experience. I had to go to, for example, there was a big center in Edison, New Jersey at one point um, that folks could drive to to get vaccinated. But if you don't have access to a vehicle, then how can you get vaccinated until there are other options available, right? And again, this is in the beginning stages of when vaccines were um, approved and readily available for the general public. Another issue of hesitancy is um, we're talking about conscience, right? So conscience is with knowledge, right? A lot of un one understanding is that with knowledge, you make your decisions um, and, and based off of this particular knowledge. While there's a lot of misinformation, even till this day, about, um, you know, the mRNA vaccines of Moderna and Pfizer, but also, of course, Johnson & Johnson, that there are computer chips in it that uh, there's radiation. I mean, the list goes on and on with a lot of false um, accusations are what are what in the particular uh, vaccine themselves. And because of this uh, disinformation or misinformation, that also creates hesitancy because individuals who believe in propaganda or, or misinformation, they believe it and, and of course that hinders them from actually taking the vaccines 
in, in the first place, right? Um, another issue I think that is important to talk about is the uh, politics, unfortunately, of the pandemic. And unfortunately, uh, from the beginning, the origins of this uh, pandemic that we're still in, unfortunately, has been politicized, right? So it's a political statement, unfortunately, so if you wear a mask. It's a political statement, unfortunately, so if you get vaccinated, right? And the last time I've checked, you know, COVID-19 is a virus. It doesn't care if you're Democrat or Republican, conservative or uh, progressive or liberal, right? A virus does what a virus does, right? Spreads to as many people as possible to continue to, uh, you know, maintain its efficacy, right? So that is another um, huge elephant in a room because of partisan politics that has, um, in my opinion, hindered the progression, or I, as, I should, as I should say, the alleviation of the spread of the virus, right? Because it's a po political conscience, if you will, um, that that folks uh, make their decision and based off of their decisions off uh, regarding uh, vaccination. So there's many different um, layers and, and variables that come into play for a person uh, to be skeptical of the vaccine, but also not take the vaccine at all. And I think these different uh, variations or understandings of conscience, right, is very important to consider in having this conversation. Kirk, thank you. And um, we, I mean, it's, it's tough to talk about sort of systemic racism in medicine without mentioning your book. Um, and I will forget the second part of the title, uh, Medical Stigmata, Race, help me out. Yeah, Medical Stigmata, Race, Medicine, and the Pursuit of Theological Liberation. I know the secondary title is a little bit lengthy, so. <laughs> I, it, 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 it always leaves me to the end. Um, but for folks interested in this, um, specifically in um, sort of the ethical issues with race-based medicine, uh, this book is great. Uh, go and get it. So thanks, Kirk. This is super helpful. I mean, we have, you sort of laid out really nicely the complications involved with vaccine hesitancy, the misinformation, like there's so much that goes into this, as well as access challenges um, within particular communities. So um, this is really super helpful, I know, um, for everyone on the call. Uh, so what I want to do now is I want to open up, because um, we have tons of uh, questions coming in in the chat. We've got questions being tweeted at us. Um, I should have mentioned before, uh, you can tweet at us um, at uh, Seton Hall Bioethics, or you can send it right to me for the moderator's handle. It's at BCP Ethics. Um, and you can send us emails for, for questions as well. And we're always, if we don't get to something, we have a resource page, which we'll send out. And we're always happy to follow up if any questions um, aren't answered. So I want to jump. Um, there's, there's a few questions coming in, both in the chat, um, on Twitter, a variety of other places, sort of pushing conceptually, which I very much appreciate, pushing conceptually on this idea of conscientious objection and making what's the usual discussion in this area um, of a comparison to military service and reasons um, one might not go into military service. This sort of analogy, I think, was made most famous, though the good bioethicist on the call can correct me, by that Stalin Emanuel piece in 2017 um, in the New England Journal of Medicine. So I'm going to jump um, first to Jason, then I'll run through. Um, Jason, for folks who don't like the idea of conscientious objection, and you know, I, I prefer a different term for this, so I'm with these people, can you just say a little bit more about that and what you think um, in sort of your own work on this about um, whether that's the right concept, if analogies to military service and all that fit, and sort of how that would um, affect thinking going forward? Yeah, so in, in my own writing, pre-COVID on uh, conscience rights in healthcare, um, yeah, I agree with Stahl and Emanuel that the comparison of what, again, gets often invoked as uh, rights of conscience say about healthcare providers say not to provide abortions or participate in medical aid and dying or, or whatever else it might be. Um, but yeah, the comparison is, is not apt because as they titled their article, physicians not conscripts, right? The whole point of conscience objection in the military is you're objecting to being drafted into the military. It's compulsory service in the military, right? Um, what, what, what would be the analogy which doesn't happen in the military, would be someone who voluntarily signs up for the army, but then says, but I, won't, I want to be in non, no, no combat zone. 
right? I'm a pacifist. I'm happy to be a nurse or to be a medic or to, you know, work, you know, be a file clerk for a general, but no, don't put it, no, you don't get that choice. If you volunteer for the army, the army puts you where the army is going to put you, right? So you can't consciously object when you volunteer. And so the whole yeah. point is that if you volunteer to go into this profession, yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that's good. Before jumping to Paul and Kirk, uh, a quick follow-up, which is, it, it, do you have any sort of grand parenting clauses in your views about folks who believe that the nature of healthcare, or at least particular, the, the internal uh, morality of particular professions within healthcare has changed. And so they feel as though they volunteered for something, but the nature of the medical endeavor changed Usually, right, medically and dying is the example here. Um, yeah, do folks get grandparented in, or is this is that too too far a stretch? Well, again, I do defend what I call conscientious refusals. So I do think that we ought to grant conscientious rights of conscientious refusal for yeah people who who gone to medicine expecting to practice their medicine in this way, and then yeah things changed, nature of medicine has changed pretty rapidly. And, and they you know, want to object to that. But again, that's still different than military conscientious objection. Because again, they could always stop being, stop practicing. I mean, that's a huge ask. It's a huge ask. But the point is they have that freedom. Where again, if you're a military conscript, you're in until you get wounded or killed, basically. Um, or do something else that gets you thrown out. I, I think a clinger on that. <laughs> right? um, Thank you. Thank you, Jason. So, I'm, so, uh, Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, so, look, so with respect to the mandate, like vaccine mandates and so on, that is a bit closer to the, the military analogy, though, because it is putting, again, you're, you're not conscripting them to get vaccinated, so to speak, because as Paul correctly mentioned, mandates are not about strapping people down and jabbing them in the arm against their will, but it is about you will experience some sort of you know, negative effect uh, at the very least, maybe a reassignment of your job if you're working in healthcare, so you're not patient facing, or potentially other penalties up to job termination or a student getting kicked out of school. So, even so, I do think the parallel is a little bit closer conceptually to the actual military conscientious objection. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Paul, since Jason mentioned you, any uh, your your thoughts on this matter if they uh, differ in any way? Um. So I think the. Right. Historically, the um, model conscientious objector, as Jason says, is the, the military conscript. Right. Um, and a few years ago, I was like when I was thinking, also trying to form my view about conscientious objection. If you go into um, do a lit search on conscientious objection, basically almost all of the literature like, you know, ethics literature on it is about military service up until the 60s, when, at least in the, in the English speaking literature, when the last English speaking, like, country abandoned conscription. And then it starts to pick up in the context of medical providers, which is around like the same time, you know, bioethics developed and there were these new technologies that allowed for, you know, the extension of life. Um, and, and also movements around like, you know, the legalization of abortion. So um, I think that it, because it, I think for a lot of people had a very um, positive uh, sort of argument around conscriptors, the same terminology was used, you know, I'm not, I don't necessarily think it's the same um, exact concept, you know, today, Right. And I think like Jason's right to point out that selective conscientious objection is not permitted in military service. Right. Um, so um, you can't volunteer and say, I'm not going to do, you know, this um, uh, because it goes against my personal scruples. Um, and I think a lot of people will want to say that's exactly the same in medicine. Right. You're a volunteer to medicine and you can't selectively conscientiously object to the process of medicine or the practice of medicine. Excuse me. And I'm not sure I, I agree with that. Like I find it um, an attractive argument, but I think it's simplistic and it doesn't, you know, um, address like the, the, the ways in which the practice can change, but also individuals' consciences 
can change. Do, do they necessarily have to quit being a physician um, uh, or a nurse or, you know, a PA or who have you? I, I, I'm not convinced of that in part because I think instances where they will say, I can't comply with this expectation may be infrequent in their career. And I, I'm not necessarily sure we want to make people pay that cost. Um, you know, are there smaller um costs that they might be expected to pay. I, I, I might think that that's fair. Thanks, Walt. Uh, helpful. And then we have, um, our, our panelists are also kind enough to respond in the chat. We have a pretty active um, chat going on notions of war, illicit acts, um, and all that. And given Jason's mention of illicit acts, if you want the full view on this, um, and Jason, jump in and help me before I turn to Kirk, uh, the book they must read is Metaphysics and Bioethics. What's the rest of the title? Oh, oh my, my book, yeah. um, uh, The Nature of Human Persons, Metaphysics and Bioethics, which is not at all about war, just war, though. But <laughs> No, but I mean, that's, that's the book, if you're thinking about sort of in a deeply, fair to say, Thomistic way about these kinds of issues. Um, and I, yeah, I focused on the second half of your uh, title. I forgot the second half of Kirk's. So, Kirk, Jump in on this. Anything to add to what uh, Jason or Paul has laid out um, on this one? Otherwise, we'll jump to a different question. Yeah, just a, a just a quick um, a, a amend, a amendment, if you will. Um, so, I also think we should uh, really look at how individualism. Uh, we are looking at that through conscientious uh, objection, but how um, individualism could be a good thing, but in a pandemic. Uh, maybe not so much, considering you could carry a virus that could literally exterminate or uh, send somebody to the hospital or get them severely sick. So I think we also should, in this conversation, consider at least some form of utility, right? Um, that, that you know, what is the overall good? And I know this is more going into utilitarianism and, and deontological ethics and all that. Um, but also, um, what is better for the greater good? Right. If I could temporarily alleviate some of my own individualism in order for the collective whole to be well long term, is that worth considering? Right. And, okay, and again, that is the question that um, we ought to pose ourselves. Um, it reminds me of um, not even in the Spanish flu in 1918, but in the mid uh, 20th century regarding um, polio. Right. Um, I wonder if uh, those individuals who lived at that time. Uh, we're at the level of individualism that we are today. Because if they were, um, a lot of us wouldn't be here. A lot of genealogies would have been stripped because they would have refused to take a, a vaccine of polio that could actually prolong um, generations, right? Um, so for me, yes, individualism is um, important, but to what extent if it is to the detriment of the whole, right? The entirety of society. So those are the things that were circulating in my mind, listening to my colleagues, uh, Paul and Jason, um, regarding conscientious uh, uh, objection. So, so yeah, that's what I wanted to share. Kirk, thanks very much. Uh, we're going to turn um, to a different kind of question um, at the moment. There's a ton going on in the chat, even uh, a reference to MASH, which I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, that's well done. Um, Old school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but we're going to turn because um, we have another set of questions. And I will say, there's a lot, there are questions in the chat about civil disobedience and a number of other sort of conceptual features. I would again plug um, Paul's work on this and that whole issue of Healthcare Ethics Committee Forum. It's worth a Google. There are articles on civil disobedience and a bunch of other topics, um, which I think would be helpful for all of you thinking through these ideas. I want to jump to another question that came into the chat early. Um, and we'll just spend a, a very brief time on it because it's, um, it's sort of an inside baseball question. I'm going to throw it at Jason because it has to do with uh, Catholic institutions. Um, and so somebody early on had asked about, um, you know, the arguments that you've offered in terms of uh, the, the conclusion of which was no Catholic um, ought to uh, sort of reference Catholicism as the reason and fix up my language here as to why they won't go in for a vaccine. For members of the Seton Hall community and people who listen to our podcast, you know, a similar view is offered by uh, Father Colin McKay, who runs all of uh, mission and ministry at, at, at Seton Hall. Um, so someone's asking, if that's the case, um, what about instances of particular uh, parish priests or other members of the church broadly who are um, supporting uh, vaccine exemptions or writing notes for vaccine exemptions 
in light of, um, you know, uh, a, a person being Catholic. So can you help? So, uh, I'm not going to get anybody in trouble. Can you help us think through um, how, how this should work? Yeah, they shall read, read my articles. <laughs> That's how it should work. No, um, so, so, I mean, so here's the issue, right? I, I referenced before the, you know, the Vatican, the Congregation of Doctrine of the Faith, right? They put out a definitive statement um, uh, in December, 20, December 2020, as the vaccines are first starting to roll out, in which they made clear that a Catholic concerned about these links to um, uh, these, you know, aborted fetal, these uh, immortalized cell lines from aborted fetuses, that they're any Catholic, any person in good conscience can receive these vaccines, okay? Yes, that's a moral concern, but you can receive the vaccine and that's the complicated, you know, moral the theological questions about remote material cooperation and formal cooperation and so on, I don't have time to really go into. But what the CDF did not say is that every Catholic ought to be vaccinated, right? And now Pope Francis in a couple of statements said, you know, I think it's a moral obligation to get vaccinated. It's an act of love, right? And for me as a Catholic, that informs my conscience. I'm, as, as a, a, a former Orthodox bioethics colleague used to call me a biopapist. <laughs> when the Pope speaks, I, I listen. Not that, you know, everything the Pope says is infallible, but I think he's right about this. But even that was not like some sort of ex cathedra statement binding on the conscience of Catholics. So here's what you have is you have the church, particularly in America, this is true in other places, but this is a, a very much what we're seeing is very much in the American Catholic Church, is again, people having these maybe broader political concerns, maybe being a bit overly scrupulous about this connection to abortion, despite what the CDF said, and wanting to exercise their conscience-based right not to get the vaccine. Whether it's, you know, again, it's a, a sincerely held belief about the abortion connection or based on mistaken information, like they think that fetuses are being aborted now to make vaccines, which is not the case. And so, the, so, but because of that, some, again, Catholic bishops, Catholic priests, even an organization like the National Catholic Bioethics Center, which if, you, if you're not annoyed by the sound of my voice when I listen to it for three hours, you can listen to a three hour podcast debate with the NCBC on this. But the point being is that they are adopting the view of that vaccine mandate of robust religious exemptions, and yes, are providing the means for Catholics to exercise that. It's worth noting that several prominent Catholic bishops, including Cardinal Blaise Kupich in Chicago, uh, Cardinal uh, Dolan in New York, uh, uh, Bishop uh, McElroy in San Diego, as well as some others, have explicitly instructed their priests not to sign these exemption forms, to not witness that the, to the mistaken view that Catholics have a religious basis for conscience of, uh, objection. So this is an internal debate uh, among Catholics, but at least what reforms my conscience as a Catholic, the Pope and the CBF have been very clear on this, as, as well as the U.S. Conference on Catholic Bishops. Jason, thank you. And I think that's a really helpful example, um, which folks who are involved in these kinds of conversations, th this was helpful for. And those who may not be, right, it, it's an excellent example we can extrapolate from about some of the challenges in working through different kinds of inter and intra-traditional conversations um, about these issues. Um, and so that's really helpful. Um, I wanna turn to Kirk on a different question, but first, um, just a reminder, um, we do now offer uh, CMEs uh, for this. So we've put in the chat uh, a link you can click on. Um, and so please do that, it'll get you an evaluation form you can fill out, of course, stay to the end, we got about nine minutes left. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you're interested in CMEs, you, you can get CMEs for this. Um, so Kirk, and the, I guess the second thing is, thanks to everyone who's here. These questions are phenomenal. Like the stuff coming through the chat is heavy hitting and it's, it's um, yeah, we're, we're not able to answer all of them, but it's, uh, it's thought provoking, it's really great stuff. So uh, Kirk, I'm turning to you because one of the other questions coming through in the chat has to do with the relationship between society and the healthcare establishment. And partly due to, I think, some of the political interconnections that Jason was referencing. Um, uh, the, the person in the chat who mentioned, I believe, being a, a frontline physician, I said that there, there's a loss of trust between um, folks coming in and seeking care and those who are providing it, um, and maybe for a variety of reasons. 
this is a tough question. A anything that you see that could be done to help regain that kind of trust? Um, yeah, I think first there has to be some um, continuity between um, the health departments at the federal level and also at the local level. I mean, a more recent example in here in New Jersey, um, the CDC c continues to suggest to, you know, wear masks inside. We just got a tweet from Governor Phil Murphy that they're going to loosen mask restrictions starting March 7th, right? So there's a lot of confusion, right, and disjointedness regarding communication. Um, and that definitely doesn't help uh, the general population in trusting, right? When you hear one thing one month and then the next thing you hear a completely opposite thing the other month, it causes confusion. Um, and it, uh, it really delegitimizes uh, what they're trying to do, right? And of course, I know it's very difficult. There's different variants. And of course, the uh, virus continues to shift and, and mutate. So you have to go by what is current. But I think they really need to have some continuity and in, in collectively in, in, in saying we should keep masks or we shouldn't. Um, also regarding vaccinations as well, um, they should also have continuity within that so um, that's one particular piece I think that is uh, effective regarding the um, knowledge and the, um, the communication um, aspect of, of, of the pandemic. So I think if they could actually have some cohesiveness, that is a start to um, gaining trust. Um, the second is really reaching out to local leaders as well. Um, so, of course, we see commercials with doctors um, and, and all of that, which is important. But also, why not involve, for those who are comfortable, um, you know, religious leaders or local leaders that um, are concerned about the health of the fellow population, right, or the fellow uh, society that um, they're responsible for and the communities that they're responsible for. So I think that is another um, piece that will also help um, bring some familiarity. Oh, Reverend so-and-so, Rabbi so-and-so, um, Iman so-and-so says, you know, I took the vaccine, I'm wearing a mask to protect myself. It makes it more um, personable and realistic as well. Um, so I think those are, the, those are two ways that I think will at least help alleviate um, some mistrust um, with between, of course, society, communities, and the medical establishment as a whole. Hey, Kurt, thank you. I mean, the the consistency point is, um, yeah, is is well well laid out and and well taken, and also just highlighting the different folks in authority or who are trustworthy in different kinds of communities. Well done, um, Paul. Can I follow up on that, Brian? Please. Yeah. So, so I, I, Kirk, I agree. I think we have a, you know a vastly fragmented public health system that right, is not coordinated state to state and even within states is uncoordinated because we don't really have a you know, national central public health authority that all the then sub ones are responsible to. And so you're going to get loads of you know, conflicting and different um, uh, reports and, and, you know, and depending on you know, how they're collecting data, even like maybe pictures of like how severe uh, a, a pandemic can be. Um, but like, and I want to connect that though to, to your earlier point about like how we have a culture that emphasizes individualism, right? Is that public health ethics, which is sort of maybe the more recent, you know, um, areas of bioethics to develop, right? Emphasizes other values than individualism and talks about solidarity. And I think we don't have like, a, a in at least in our discourse, a robust, you know, um, understanding of public health and the kinds of communal commitments to um, that, that that requires that would, you know, I think create um, a, a framework or paradigm in which to articulate the responsibility of an individual to become vaccinated um, against also these, you know, other um, qualms. Um, so I think that, that that's a huge challenge. Um, and, and I think you're right to highlight it. Thank you. And to answer quickly the question, um, continuity or clear communication, um, I think both. 
um, <laughs> um, in that regard. Um, um, and of course, social media also is another factor, right? Because that's where most people get their information and knowledge. And of course, social media is not regulated and it's not vetted. So that is another um, hindrance um, that we also have to deal with in this conversation regarding uh, vaccines and vaccinations. Thank you, Kirk. That, Paul, great points, great points. Unfortunately, uh, though I would like to talk with you guys about this forever, and you all know that, um, we're running uh, low on time. So a reminder to click on um, the link, put in a chat regarding CMEs, and we can get um, that information up. But as we close out in the last couple of minutes, uh, just one line from uh, each of our panelists, for folks who have come, for folks who are thinking about these issues, for folks who live it every day, uh, what one line would you leave them uh, with? And I'll start with Jason, uh, go to Paul, and then end with Kirk. So Jason, one line, what do you got? One line, very carefully inform your conscience. We're, we're responsible not just for acting on our conscience, but we're having a well-formed conscience. And so this, again, this goes to Kirk's point about uh, and about where you get information from and so on, yeah. Excellent, uh, thank you very much. Paul, one line. Um, I think my, my, what I would encourage people just to think about is that for sincere conscientious objectors, right, you have to recognize the validity of the expectation and that there's a real um, attempt to balance here between attempts to allow people to follow their conscience, but also to meet legitimate goals that we have for living together. Thank you, Paul. Uh, well said. And Kirk, wrap us up. Yeah, um, I think in this conversation, we have to realize that it's not about me, but also about we, about the collective good a as a whole. And I always suggest, you know, based, you know, get the information, get your facts. But if you haven't been vaccinated, you know, have that conversation, seek out that information, make that conscientious decision, like my colleague Jason said, and um, protect yourselves and, of course, the loved ones and friends and family around you. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Again, if you're interested in CME credits, here is the information um, that you can access those. Uh, for those who are interested in other kinds of continuing education credits, we are working very hard um, to get some more uh, credit opportunities available. Please join us next month um, when we're going to be engaging questions of universal health care and universal health coverage. Uh, thank you all for attending. Thank you for the wonderful questions. And do um, check out our recording if you want to follow up and please uh, view our resource page. Uh, thank you all and have a good day. Thank you.